Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher, and today we're going to talk about how the priority of adventure can change through life's transitions. Today's guest is a 50-something adventurer who only started backpacking a few years ago. As a military spouse and mom of three, me time felt impossible for her. I have with me Tammy Fondry from Sacramento, California, also known by her Instagram handle, at Tammy on the Trail. When Tammy's last child left for college, she felt a void, and she came to recognize that it was finally time for her. Now, in the second half of life, she has a whole list full of dreams, places she wants to explore, and adventures to experience. She's already accomplished so much, and I believe she is just getting started. Tammy, welcome to the campfire. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be with you in this stage. I appreciate it. I am so excited. We've been so inspired by your Instagram page and all the adventures that you've been on just to come to find out that it looks like you've had this lifetime full of adventure and it's like all been jammed into just a couple of short years. My goodness, I wondered if we could just dive in and maybe we'll backtrack afterwards, but if you could just share like in the last three years, what are some of these big adventures that you've been on? I don't really do anything small. So <laughs> I have a tendency to dream really big and then wonder if my body can handle it and try to catch up. Everything started for me about in COVID time. I think it happened to a lot of people during the pandemic is mm -hmm. we struggled to find joy through that. Everybody's yeah. trapped at home and it's hard. And it just so happened that my oldest daughter at the time, I think she was 25, had been doing all these amazing adventures, going to national parks. And she went to Italy and I had never been to Italy. And there were just all these things that she had done. And I was just sitting back admiring. And we always want the best for our kids. We want better for them than we had. Yeah. And so I'm watching her adventures. And she invited me on a trip in 2021 and I had to borrow a backpack from a neighbor and it just became this journey that I realized what was out there for me that maybe I hadn't recognized was there. And I started off pretty quickly at deciding to do a 220 mile trek of the John Muir Trail and finish with summiting Mount Whitney. At 14.5, I'll throw in there the fact that I get altitude sick at 6,000 feet. <laughs> so I, I like a good challenge. So I have done so many treks since then. I've done a portion of the Appalachian Trail. I have done rim to rim Grand Canyon backpacking. Mm -hmm. I just got back from the Tour de Mont Blanc doing 120 miles. Yeah. In 10 days, it was such a blast. It, it's just, there's this thing about nature for me that just makes me feel whole. And I don't think I've ever felt that in my lifetime. I've spent the majority of my lifetime raising children, taking care of my house, I worked as an entrepreneur for years, owned businesses, but nothing was really for me. It felt like what it was for me until I discovered nature and backpacking. I don't do anything small, apparently. No, apparently not. Well, I'm not the kind of person that can be like, hey, I can't run anymore because my knee replacement. But I'm not the kind of person that goes, oh, I'm going to go run four miles today. I'm going to run four miles for a goal of doing a triathlon or something like that. So I always had a goal in sight. Yeah. And somehow I've been lucky enough to attain them. There is so much in this. I love this story. And I also am really connected because we've talked before this. There are several things that you've done recently that are also on my list of things that I hope to do. Tour de Mont Blanc being one of them. Mount Whitney, huge. So I can't wait to dig into a couple of those, especially that the John Muir Trail. But I want to go back. 
So your daughter invites you on this trip. And can you tell us about that first, that very first one before John Muir Trail that kind of triggered this desire in you to be able to say yes to the next one, which was the big one? I came home from that trip in Idaho and Montana, and I think the first thing I did was buy a backpack. Nice. And, and I didn't even know what I was buying, but I did plenty of research. And then I found the ultralight world and knew that I had knee issues. So I had to be as light as I could. When we went up in Idaho, I, my pack was probably 40 pounds. And yeah. I was only three weeks out from a knee surgery. <laughs> I was cleared, to be fair. I was cleared at two weeks. It was a meniscus cleanup. So it wasn't a big deal, but I was three weeks out from surgery. As it turned out, I bought the backpack and I reached out to a friend of mine and said, hey, do you want to go up to Mount Tamalpais and backpack with me? And she was like, yeah. And she had never been backpacking either. So we both got, we got our backpacks and figured it all out. and then. We spent a night up in Mount Tam and I knew I was hooked. And so the two of us, we planned, we did the Trans Catalina Trail not long after that in the spring. So it was just maybe a month after Mount Tamalpais. And that was, I said, I didn't tell anybody at that point, but I knew that if I could complete the five days of the TCT, that I could pretty much do the JMT, despite mm -hmm. the fact that I did get altitude sick. So there's that whole part. And a component that I actually learned how to train my body to accept the elevation and was successful with it. It took weeks and weeks of me going up to Tahoe for it. It worked out. So I just keep biting off bigger things. Can we go to the first trip with your daughter and maybe even this trip to Mount Tam? Like these short trips, like something happened, like something just flipped for you and you're just like, this, like you even said earlier that the thing about nature is it makes you feel whole, but like something happened in that first trip or two. Can you, do you remember, was there like a moment or was there an experience? I've seen Costa Rica. I've been to Bali, but nothing was like nature related. When honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I even could grasp what was out there for me. I had spent all these years as a military spouse. My husband was deployed. We lived in Japan for five years. He was deployed for 275 days a year. There wasn't an opportunity for me to do things like that. And so I think when we were in Idaho, we climbed up and it was crazy. Let me just be honest with you. Like it's grizzly country. I did have bear spray, but I also hung a bag of food up in a tree after a video that I watched on YouTube. And I since now use a bear can for pretty much everything because nothing gets into my pack with a bear can. I think it was just like, there was the, just this fear component of like, I do believe that we should all do things that scare us a little bit. Most of what I do scares me a bit. At the time I was afraid of heights. I was obviously afraid of bears. And we did this, we climbed up in Idaho up to these hot springs and it was probably about wasn't a big hike. It was about five miles. It just was that we got trapped in a, a thunderstorm, the lightning, there were fires around in Oregon that year. And I don't know, it was just the excitement of I'm going to sleep out here and nobody can save me because I'm really far away. And am I okay with that? I have lived my life pretty controlled up to that point where I wouldn't put myself into danger because I have children to raise. And I guess something changed in me that made me go, oh, it's okay to be a little scared. Like we should be scared a little bit. That's the excitement of life, right? That's why people do adventure, travel, climbing, hiking. It's the excitement of seeing things that we wouldn't normally see. I live in the city. I live basically downtown. I'm very urban living but I can go an hour away and I'm in the mountains. You mentioned a lot about fear and being a little bit out of your comfort zone. Do you think there was an element of playing safe early on? I, I think there were components to my life where I wasn't really able to take risks like that. With my husband deployed a lot, I also had a daughter who had an illness for 10 years. And we basically, my vacations were living in the hospital all over the country. We flew all over to get her help. But I think there just was this part of me that 
knew that if I wasn't there, my kids, how would they go on? People go on and survive things like that all the time. But it's, I just had this different added, I feel like weight on my shoulders as a mom and a wife to do so much more than most I felt like with military yeah. being and having a daughter that had an illness. So it's like there was a lot of weight on my shoulders and there wasn't that ability for me to be like, oh, I can just go climb a mountain. And what if something happens? I don't know. I think something changed for me when my son went off to college and it was hard, so hard. I cried for so long, <laughs> but I really was not prepared. The reality of people say, oh, it's really hard when your kids go off to college. But the reality is my son was three years old when his sister got sick and I lost 10 years with both of my other children. So focused on getting her better. And there was just a lot that just fell to the side. And I felt like I lost 10 years with him too, as well as my older daughter. I lost those years. So it just felt a little different for me to just be on their own and do their lives. And I don't know, maybe I just put way too much into it, but I never took care of myself. Yeah, it sounds almost like there's like an element of trying to get back lost time almost. Oh yeah, for sure. I feel, and, I, and I feel like a lot of people talk a lot about the inner child. I had a really rough childhood growing up and had to fend for myself a lot. I, I, my brother and I joke that we were both pretty feral. I was probably cooking dinner for my dad, my brother, and I when I was eight years old. So I was forced to grow up early and fast. And for the most part, sports mm. was my life. I played all season sports in high school and played competitive tennis afterwards up until my knee replacement. There are things in our lives that fill spaces and sports really filled spaces for me. But yeah, I think there's a degree of me making up for time. All those years that I spent on a tennis court is in nature, but is it? And then I look at what I'm doing now and it's, you don't get views like that from a tennis court. Well, it's so interesting because as we're sitting here talking, I'm actually, I'm seeing this as like the kind of the season that you're going through now is like a celebration of the hard work that you've put in up to this point. I so I'm really seeing that. I say that too, because... When I, so my husband travels for a living. It, it's not his favorite thing to be in a hotel <laughs> and go on vacation and do things like that. And for me, I feel like I've missed out on things that I think other people have enjoyed for years. It's like I'll go hiking with someone and they're like, oh yeah, my parents took me hiking. And I'm like, it wasn't even on my radar. Yeah. None of that was on my radar, truly. And I do feel like I'm making up for lost time. And it, it's so interesting because my husband at one point said to me, I'm always very good about going, hey, are you okay if I do this? This is something I really want to do. Are you okay? And he's, yeah, go do it. And he said to me not too long ago when I stopped working and I stepped down from the nonprofit that I was co-running and he said, well, you've done so much for family over the years in raising the kids, taking care of the kids, dealing with the hospital stuff, working in addition to it all. It's your time. Go enjoy your time. And I think having a spouse that's supportive of stuff like that is huge. <laughs> First of all, he's private. But second of all, I do a lot of these things solo or with friends and it just works out for us that way. It's always been that way. So yeah, I do feel like I'm making up for a lot of time that it was hard. We had some hard years, for sure. Well, it's awesome that you've got such a supporter and encourager there in your court, nudging you to get after this. Hey everyone, it's Scott here. Did you know that the members of my real estate team, W Realty Group, are listening to their own voices that call to adventure by setting big goals? Some of those goals include planning trips to Bali and the Kingdom of Bhutan, buying investment homes and running the Chicago Marathon. At W Realty Group, we support and encourage these big goals and want to help turn them into reality. We're currently looking to add new members to the team. If you know a great real estate agent in the Charlotte, North Carolina area that would benefit from being part of our team, please send a text, an email, or give me a call. And know that when you support W Realty Group, you're also supporting this podcast. Thanks for listening. Yeah. You and I had a conversation a couple of days ago. 
And one thing that really struck me, and I'm going to get out of order here, but if we go way back to like before kids, you shared with me a story <laughs> about like wanting to get into nature and do some stuff and it didn't go the way you thought it was going to. Okay, so here's the story. So back, I, I got married really young, but I was ready. I met him and I was like, yep. So we got married in 1992. I was 20 years old. And I want to say around 93, 94-ish, my husband and I, REI was like big back then, went to REI, spent $1,000, which is a big deal for us on a yeah. second lieutenant salary. And I worked and we, we really didn't have $1,000 to spend on gear, but we bought backpacks, we bought tents, we bought backpacks for our dogs. We took our dogs with us and we went backpacking. We were supposed to be there for four nights. The very first night, we're in Missouri at this point. We're in the mountains down in Missouri and we have our dogs with us. And all of a sudden, it was probably two in the morning and we start hearing howling and it was yeah. not coyotes. It was wolves. <laughs> and we have our dogs and we're in the tent, we're huddled and we're like freaking out. And I was just like, this is so not for me. And he's, this is not for me. We literally packed up in the middle of the night and we hiked back to our car. <laughs> And that was it. And honestly, we've moved so many times with the military, probably, I don't know, I think we moved 10 or 12 times. So a lot of our stuff got and ended up into storage. And then it was long term storage and to be in these bins. And when we finally moved to Sacramento seven years ago, we went through all of our bins and a pull out. I should have saved it, but I didn't. But my purple backpack, I think it was purple. And it literally just crumbled as I pulled it out of the yeah. bin. Uh, if it had been in California, probably yeah. up in the attic in a black Rubbermaid tote, it just fell apart. It was so gross. But it was like a reminder, like we never used it again. Never. And that was 92. I was 22 years old, probably. I never backpacked again until Idaho. This is where I think is so interesting because I'm hearing you talk about like making up for lost time. But at the same time, this is where like seasons of life and like people change and these transitions and having the right experiences at the right time. And then as we talked about, this episode really is about priorities. But that early on, like it wasn't for you. And I just. It I was not. I was not in the season of my life to accept <laughs> wolves and critters. It has taken me time to get there. But yeah, it just wasn't the time for me. There's other things like I used to, I had a boyfriend in college that rock climbed. And I learned how to rock climb in, at the time, I think it was Cuyahoga State Park. Now I think it's a yeah. national park. That's where I learned to rock climb. And I have not been rock climbing technically 18, 19 years old, but until now. <laughs> well, I, I, I just think it's so interesting because you had that opportunity to come into adventure and do these things that you're enjoying so much now, but back then it wasn't for you. And so I do want to talk a little bit about priorities because then the next season of your life comes in and this is a heavy season of your life. Your priorities were in a very different place. So I wonder if you could just walk us through that next season of life. Literally, I don't know, three weeks ago, I was on the Tour de Mont Blanc and we were up on the Col de Bonhomme, which is a pass up. Oh, let's see, where is it? I believe it's, it's in France. It was probably on day three, and we are literally walking through slushy snow, no crampons, no micro spikes. And I, I was on a guided trip. The guide, she knows what she's doing. But there were moments where I was like, why don't I have my micro spikes on? And we were trudging across the snow field, probably an eighth of a mile, I'd say, where we went over the pass and we're going through to another pass. And I'm not joking. There's that moment where I looked down and I thought, all I thought of was my kids. But I'm in a different season of my life. The moment that you're in those spots, like I look to the right and it's a sheer cliff. If I make one wrong step and I'm not paying attention, I'm not going to survive. Yeah. That's what it was. And I've been in those instances a few times in the last few years. Mount Whitney was one of them because we summited Whitney at sunrise so we climbed up Mount Whitney in the dark with headlamps and there are just those moments that are different for me now it's I guess the best way I can describe it outside of being a mom is that I would have never put myself in those situations before for probably more out of fear than anything 
But now I'm at a point in my life at 52 where I feel like if I die falling off a cliff, I have lived a life. And I think three years ago, if I would say that, it, it wasn't on my radar, right. for one, but I didn't feel like I had lived a life for myself yeah. at that point. When I was 49, coming into 50, and I, there is something about a woman coming into her 50-year birthday that changes everything. And I've talked to so many friends that are like, something just broke when I was 50. So there was that whole, it was almost like a moment where everything just came to a head. And it's, I have to figure out who I am and what I want, because up to now, I haven't, I've lived my life for everybody but me. And I, to, to say that now, to think that, yes, when I'm up in that snow and I think about my kids, I think about, I'm alive. Like I'm walking through snow on the top of a pass in the French Alps and one wrong step, I'm gone. Yeah. And it, there's just something about that just makes you feel alive. I don't know. It's I'm not a huge thrill seeker. So let's just put that out there. I shouldn't say it like that, but they feel a little late in life sometimes. Like I wish when I was 30, I can't imagine what it would have been like ice climbing when I was 30 in a 30 year old body that could just like <laughs> and, and get right up. I think there's parts of it that I have to work harder at 52 to do the things that I want to do. Can you take us back and just talk us through life as a military mom, life with your daughter? And I know she experienced some illness. And so I wonder if you could just talk us through that. Okay. So I married my husband at 20. He was 24. Within a couple of years, he changed assignments and we ended up in Okinawa, Japan for five years. I went over pregnant. I was about seven months pregnant. I was right at the cusp of when you can fly and can't fly. Instead, I just do a 16 hour flight. How fun. I get there. I didn't know anybody. We moved there. He deployed so much while we were there. He was in special operations and we didn't have cell phones. My husband couldn't tell me when he was leaving, couldn't tell me when he was coming home. He'd just show up and he'd be gone three weeks or three months. You have no idea what to plan for. And I have these little babies and I had another baby. Literally the day we got home from the hospital with our second daughter, who they were 17 months apart. My second daughter comes around the corner. And he's, I'm so sorry. I'm leaving tomorrow. And I'm like, I have a three day old baby and a 17 month old and I'm on my own. I told you before that I grew up early. I did. I yeah. was way mature at, at this age, at 24, having kids 26 and learned to rely on myself a lot. I'm not good at asking for help, which comes with a lot of the trauma of childhood when you grow up that way. So I did everything myself. I was like, I can do it. He was gone quite a bit those five years. It was really hard. It was me and the girls. And it was a tough life. Living as a military spouse is really hard. He ended up retiring out at 26 years as a lieutenant colonel. In addition to the military member serving is also the spouse and the kids go right along with it. We all serve together. It is a pride thing and it's a beautiful thing, but a very hard life. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into when you marry into the military. So it was a hard life, but I learned my strengths early on. I just didn't know what I had in me, truly, until I was living overseas with two kids. We came back to the U.S. We ended up settling in California. I had another child. We have three kids. They're all grown now, 28, 27, and 21. And they're all off living their lives and doing their own things. And definitely was challenging for them as well as being children of a military member. It's so funny. Last night, my daughter and I had dinner together and she's, can we make breakfast for dinner like we used to when dad was deployed? And she's 27. We had a blast. We had breakfast for dinner last night. It was so cool. But, and then go into when my daughter was nine, she ended up having a really horrific illness that made it, made life really hard for everybody, for her mostly. And it's hard. It's still at this point, we're 10 years out and it's so hard to talk about. She wasn't able to eat, wasn't able to walk at times, was wheelchair bound, was bed bound. We spent 
the majority of 10 years in a hospital. And that just added a whole component. My husband would be deployed and I'm at the hospital. I have two other kids that got juggled all over the place thanks to so many friends and family who would step up. But it just was a hard life. It was not easy. And I would, in the hospital, take my road bike because she was in the hospital here in Sacramento. And we have this beautiful American River Trail. And I would just ride my bike. I would get my road bike out and I'd ride 15, 20 miles a night, come back, and I could survive. I'm very energy driven. Like I need that release of exercise to stay calm. And during those periods when she was in hospital, there were some days I couldn't do that. Some days I couldn't step away. But when I did, it was like the best thing for me mentally. I've always had an outlet of some kind of physical outlet that I've used, but it came in different forms throughout my life. I've done all kinds of different things. So um, I really appreciate you sharing all that because as we talk about all of this 50 something that all of a sudden discovers adventure, it's okay, great. Like she's doing all this stuff, but it comes with this incredible, like you've lived a hard life and you've had a lot of responsibility and a lot of weight on your shoulders and you crushed it. To me, it does feel like it's time to celebrate. Like you've worked really yeah. hard. That's so true. Yeah, I do. Yeah, there's definitely no guilt. And my husband is, he's the one that has pushed me so many times. Like, yeah. I'll be like, oh, I think I want to do this. He's oh yeah, you should do it. I'm like, what? I don't know. And he's like, you should go do it. There have been many times and in instances where he's pushed me to do something where I get a little light in my head. Um, and I don't know. I feel like the sky's the limit at this point. 52, I'm in the best shape of my life. I feel strong. I feel I don't feel invincible for sure. Every time I go do something, I just went and did this hike back in Tahoe. And it was, I knew going into it that it was a dangerous bit of a hike and people get rescued out of there all the time. It was a scramble as you get to the top. And we, there were some of us that went forward and some of us that just went, mm, yeah, I think I'm okay. I'm actually, and I was one of the ones that stayed behind. And we ended up getting caught on this rock face that the granite was actually slippery and we had to like we had to literally like crawl army crawled down to the bottom and there was a moment there where I was like there were four people behind me and I thought I can't even go look back because I felt like I was gonna fall and we all made it just fine but there are moments where I do go okay so I'm just finding the parameters of what I'm okay with and what I'm not okay with it's stuff that people probably learned when they were 20 and I just feel like I don't know what my limits are yet which is beautiful it's a beautiful thing to go I don't really have limits right now I don't know what my limits are so I wonder again this being a lot of this conversation being about priorities as you reflect back on the whole experience from 20 years old and getting married and going on that first like backpacking trip, deciding it's not for you. And then your whole experience as a mom, a military spouse, and now finding yourself. What do priorities mean to you now? Can we talk a little bit about priorities? I think <laughs> it, I feel moments where I'm like, yeah, the priority's me right now. <laughs> so, so, so. Great. No, it's awesome. It sounds selfish, but I truly, to be honest with you, I feel like I've lived probably five lives. At 52, I feel like each decade of my life was living five different lives. Parts of my childhood were traumatic and hard, but shaped who I am. All of these decades have come together and make me feel like I've lived five lives, yeah. but it's such a rich I have such a rich perspective for so many things. So many things I don't sweat because I've been sweating for a long time. <laughs> you know, like I don't sweat little things. My priorities are probably more grounded in trying to find who I am. I'm still working on that and trying to also honor the inner child inside me that didn't have opportunities and didn't have support. I think the priorities in my life now are to be surrounded by people who love me and support me and love me for who I am 
as I've gotten older, my ADHD got way worse and I ended up having to be medicated for it. ADHD also has been my creative side. I'm, I'm, I have a whole creative side that goes beyond anything that you see on my Instagram these days. Most of my Instagram followers from the very beginning were following me when I owned a home and garden store. So I'm like super multifaceted in so many <laughs> weird ways. I could MacGyver anything. I'm a contractor by trade. Most people don't even know that about me. I'm a licensed, state licensed California contractor. Nice. I love I'm it. Not really working anymore because my husband's stopped working. And so now, now I'm doing all this traveling and I overheard him with the neighbors one time. One of my neighbors was like, how are you doing all this traveling? What is going on? I said, Dan said, I shouldn't be working anymore. And I hear him pipe in from the back and he's, and we live with our choices. <laughs> and I was like, yes, we do. I love it. I just so, think. So many people are going to be able to relate to your story, especially just the the grind of what you went through as a mom. And now it's just super inspiring to see you falling into this place where you're now able to recognize yourself and prioritize yourself. And I think that's so awesome. One thing I, I want to talk, I want to get into the John Muir Trail just a little bit because that was like, that was the first big one. But before we do that, and as we're talking about priorities, when we talked the other day, you said something really interesting to me. You said that now that you've stepped into adventure, you made a comment that you wish that you had introduced your kids to adventure, but as it happens, it happened the other way around. And I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit. It sure did. It is, it's so important to me when I'm on a trail and I see families with kids, I almost always stop and say, look at you out here. This is so cool. You're out here hiking. And I love kids anyway, but to me, like, I am so envious of that. Like, I came into nature from my daughter taking me to Idaho. Like, it was the other way around. Like, I didn't come into nature as a child where my parents took me anywhere. Like, we, we used to camp in the backyard. I do remember having a tent. I used to love the tent, but it sat up in our backyard. And that was like, that was our adventure. So I think to say that my daughter brought me to nature, she really did. I watched her doing all these things and went, why wouldn't I do those things? And there were things in my life that stopped me from that. I'm raising kids or my job or my businesses all day. But the truth is, she brought me to nature. It wasn't me bringing my kids to nature. It was her but bringing there's, me. There's something really cool in that, at least like yeah. from my perspective, looking at your story and seeing like all that you did for your family. But how cool is it that you gave them the hard work that you did, just like putting them first for 20 something years and yeah. for them to be the ones to introduce you into nature and help you find this new version of you, like heading into your 50s in the second half of life. It's really cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool too. It, it definitely is. One of the main reasons I do my Instagram and keep up with it is because I get so many messages from women that are like getting ready to take their kids to college or in that season of, okay, what about me? And I think it's really important to inspire other women. I have taken three group, two just two women only backpacking groups where I've taken women out backpacking for the first time. So take them out on an overnight trip. We usually go to Alamere Falls because in San Francisco, North San Francisco area, it's just a great one day, one night turnaround. And that feeds my soul is to share my love and things that I've learned. I basically learned backpacking from the internet. I found creators on Instagram that inspired me to get out there and, and I learned everything on my own. So I love sharing the wealth of knowledge that I've gained in three years. That to me is probably my priority for my Instagram and for doing what I do is just to inspire other women to know that life doesn't end because your kids go to college and they leave. Your life just begins. At least mine has. It's like a flower. It's been flourishing. The journey of the last three years is incredible, right? You went from this place where you said you dropped your last child off at college and kind of felt this void. And then you pick up adventure. You start doing these things. And before you know it, you've got this huge following on Instagram and you actually have companies that are reaching out to you 
to have you come speak to large groups. What is that like for you to have gone through this? I think most people that have followings on Instagram feel this imposter syndrome. I'm just a normal person. I'm just mopping my floors in the morning like everybody else. It's so bizarre to me, honestly. And I have such a great, I feel like such a huge community with my Instagram. I don't have any negativity. Thank goodness, please. If anybody hears this and you want to be negative, go somewhere else. I put out a positive vibe because I believe that we all need to be supportive and we need to do things that feel safe to us. Fortunately for me, I've never had any negativity for the most part on Instagram. And it continuously baffles me that anybody is following me. It's just such a wild thing to think that like 13,000 people are watching what I do. It just blows my mind. But it is a cool thing. And yes, I have enjoyed it. I have worked recently with some companies that I truly believe in their products, what they do for the environment, the sense of community that they create. So it's just been a really fun journey for me. I, I don't know. I, I joke about it all the time. I'm like, yeah, it's just a, like a side gig, but it, people keep following me. And I'm like, I just don't get it. I don't know. There's a lot of imposter syndrome that goes with all of that. I'm just me. I'm what is what you get. I'm pretty open book. Been through a lot. And yeah, I just keep going. You have been through a lot. And this this whole story, like it seems to me like it's just this natural progression. It seems to me like when you were military spouse, raising kids, you just did what you had to do. And it was hard. And you just did it. And you're like building these habits and just doing these things. And when it comes time to now put yourself first, of course, you're going to go big because you've done big things in your life. I, I admire it. And I think the reason why you've gotten such a big following so fast is it's inspiring to like to watch what you're doing. And I think it's really cool that you're being acknowledged by companies and asked to come speak. It is. It's hugely inspiring. Thank you um, for that. That's so sweet. It really yeah. is. I mean, want, it's so bizarre to me. I want to, before we wrap up, I want to hear just a little bit about the John Muir Trail because that's a huge one on my list. Man. And summiting Mount Whitney was, has always has been on my vision board for a while. And like, come to find out the John Muir Trail leads up to it. So this was like, you literally went on like a couple of one night back to packing trips and then just decided to dive into this big trip. Can, for listeners, can you tell us like, what is the John Muir Trail? Okay. The John Muir Trail is a 211 mile trail that spans from Yosemite all the way down to Mount Whitney. It goes through Yosemite, Inyo National Parks, Kings Canyon, and Sequoia. And it is probably, I haven't been to Colorado and I certainly have not done the Cascades yet. So don't anybody fault me for this. But that span of landscape is breathtaking everywhere you look. It's 360. The valleys, the watersheds, the rivers, the mountains, the granite. It's just outstanding. It should be on everybody's bucket list. Mm. I tell people all the time. As a matter of fact, when I was on the uh, Tour de Mont Blanc, which I would have never said anything is up there, but I think TMV and JMT are right up there. It's hard to, it's different landscape, but it's neck and neck. They're both stunning places to go. But JMT is 211 miles. If you add the Whitney Summit at the end, it makes it like 220, something like that. And not everybody does the summit of Whitney for whatever reason. Maybe it's altitude sickness or whatever, but JMT coming up to it, you're building in elevation as you go. The passes end up, they start off at 8,000, then they're like 10,000, then it's 11,000, 12,000. And then I think the highest pass was Forrester, which was like 13, one, maybe something like that. But it was outstanding, just beautiful, just stunning. We decided to summit Whitney at sunrise, which meant we left Guitar Lake at about 1.30. And we were so fit and fast at that point, we had to slow down because you can't really spend, you shouldn't really spend longer than an hour up on Whitney just with the elevation. And it was so cold at sunrise. I've never been so cold in my life. 
I had every layer on, including my down quilt, and I was shivering. It was so cold, but stunning. I actually got to Summit Whitney and had cell phone service for the first time, called my husband about two minutes before the sun came up over and FaceTimed him and we watched the sunrise together oh, awesome. like 5, 20 in the morning. But yeah, we went up with headlamps. There were multiple times, I want to say four times where I went to take a step and realized it was a 4,000 foot cliff. So you just have to be careful yeah. <laughs> climbing Whitney in the dark. How long is the John Muir Trail? How long did it take you? It took me 21 days and that was always the plan. I summited on, we started August 5th, which was two years ago yesterday. Oh, and congrats. Thank you. And we summited Whitney on the 27th. So it was somewhere near 21 days. We took a Nero, um, which is a near zero day. And then we took, actually we took two Neros, mostly at Ray Lakes, which was insane. If anybody ever wants to do something like John Your Trail in three weeks, it's awesome. But if you don't have that amount of time, say you have a week, I would recommend highly the Ray Lakes Loop. It is uh -huh. outstanding. Yeah. Beautiful. So before John Muir Trail, you had just done a couple of nights. What what was it like to go from one or two nights of backpacking to that? And that's not just it's not just three weeks. It's three weeks in big mountains and altitude. Every and, day. Yeah, yeah. Every day doing 10 miles a day. It's interesting. When we left out of Yosemite Valley, I want to say the climb is like 4,000 something. It's close to that. Maybe a little less than that. We got lucky because it was sprinkling all day and I have a hard time in heat. So once we got up into the higher altitudes, obviously it was a lot cooler, somewhere in the 60s, 70s. But the first three days, I wasn't even able to eat. I don't know why I had such altitudes. It's very common for people to start the JMT and not be able to eat for the first few days. Like nothing was going down. My meals weren't going down. I had all this food and it was really, the first three days were really a challenge. And going into it, I had been through four knee surgeries on my right knee. And I was probably about six months out from my last one. But my knee surgeon at the time said, you're never going to play tennis again. You can't run again, you're done. And I was just like, gosh, what am I gonna do? And that's how I turned to hiking, to rehab for everything. And so going into JMT, I was already having some knee issues again. I had done a training hike up in Tahoe and pushed it really hard and had a hard time walking a couple of days after that. So going into it, we were down in Mammoth for a couple of days and I wasn't really honest with my partner that I started hiking with. I was in not the greatest shape with my knee taking a lot of ibuprofen and stuff. So going into it, I was the last one that anybody ever expected to finish or summit. So and including myself, like I had a lot of doubts going into it, wasn't really sure. But once I got into the fifth day, I went, okay, all right. Because you get your trail legs on day like three or four. I started eating again. Then I was hungry all the time. So the food thing, the food challenge is really hard knowing how much you're going to need because there's no resupplies other than you send certain buckets into places. So you're like doing seven days. And then I ended up going 10 days with no resupply at the very end. It's a long story and how that all went down. But I ended up carrying 10 days of food in a bear bin, which was wow. insane. And I ran out of food a couple of days prior. I had meals, but I relied on all the bear I actually found a packet of Oreos one night. I couldn't <laughs> believe my luck. It was like the best thing in the world. We found, you know, mashed potatoes and things like that. So I was able to sustain myself. I saved my favorite meal for the night before we summited Whitney. And I was almost out of food completely when we got to Whitney Portal and finished. It's crazy. 220 cool. miles. You and I are going to have more conversation at some point about this because I, I hope to do that. Like, I'm always like, feel free to reach out. I say that to everybody that I talk to on Instagram, like, feel free to reach out when you're getting ready to do the trip. I'm happy to share every bit of knowledge. So yeah, feel free to reach out because I can explain all of this resupplies and how to get the permits. And yeah, very challenging. JMT is not an easy trail to like the logistics of it are challenging. 
Tammy, I feel like you've been doing hard things your whole life. And maybe just because you're just doing what has to get done, not even like recognizing it, but now like you're doing these big things. And I'm just thinking about like people that might be listening. There's probably a point where you were just like going through hard things, not really recognizing how hard they were because you're just doing them. But now you're doing these, you're doing hard things intentionally, right? Because it's fun. Wow. <laughs> wow, way to make a conclusion out of that. Right? I, I'm just you're saying things that I didn't recognize up until you just said it. And right? it's just I can't help but see that. But wow. I want to bring this to the piece where I, I'd love for you to just talk to listeners for a second because if there's people out there that are going through like really hard things, now that you have this hindsight to see, hey, I've been doing these hard things and now I'm choosing to do hard things because it's fun. But what advice do you have for people that maybe are going through hard things but and are inspired by your story? Wow. Wow. You just said things that I hadn't even like, the things that weren't even on my radar. Yeah, I have been doing hard things. In the <laughs> I think for me, I actually just wrote a piece on gratitude not too long ago. Something that I learned early on, and and I don't even know, it just came to me as an epiphany one day. I was in the hospital with my daughter and things were really bad. And I was salty and I, I would always keep my saltiness to myself. But one day I woke up that morning and I was really exceptionally salty. <laughs> and I remember, her, and I would have to go down in my, get dressed, get coffee for myself. It's not like when you just go downstairs and get coffee in your own house. And I went down and I got coffee. And I remember just being so grateful for the coffee. And as she handed me the coffee, I was like, okay, I know how I can do this. I know how I'm going to get through this. If I can wake up every morning finding three things that I'm grateful for, then I can do anything and I can survive anything as long as I can find some gratitude in my life. And so in the beginning, it was really hard for me because it was like, okay, I'm grateful for that coffee. And then what else could I be grateful for? Because it wasn't like, it was a hard life. I was sleeping in a fold out chair next to my daughter, watching her live in a way that nobody ever wants to see their child live. And it took me weeks. It's a whole way of thinking that I do believe that we can change our way of thinking. I still, to this day, use gratitude. I still wake up every day. And before I hit the ground, I think, what are the three things that I'm grateful for today? What is it? Some days it's putting my feet on the ground. Having gone through a knee replacement and my knee surgeries and all that stuff, I had to rely on everybody else around me, which I'm not used to. I, my husband comes into the kitchen one day and I have my crutches and I'm shoving a cup of coffee across the floor. And he's, what are you doing? I'm just getting some coffee. He's like, why didn't you ask? I'm like, because it's not ingrained in me to ask. I, I just, I'm used to doing everything. And I think there's just this sense of like vulnerability and gratitude that we all need to make a part of our lives is intentional gratitude. It really can change your way of thinking. I'm a very positive thinking person anyway, but the gratitude thing is the component for why I wake up every day with a smile and feel like, okay. What am I grateful for today? My gratitude looks so much different than it did 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Before it was like a cup of coffee. Today, it's like that my body works, that I can get up and at 52, go climb a mountain if I want to climb a mountain. There's just so many different forms of gratitude. But yeah, that's the component for me is if you're struggling with things in life, the most important thing you can do is find three things you're grateful for. I Start it. it in the morning, wake up that way. And that's intentional I, gratitude. I love it. We've toured Mont Blanc, John Muir Trail, all, all kinds of other good stuff. And you're just getting started. I'm going to let it out what I'm doing. Are you ready? Let's go. This is really hard for me. I'm putting my tennis membership on hold at my gym and I'm joining a climbing gym this week. Wow. Nobody that's amazing. knows that yet. Amazing. Because in February... I was in Chamonix with my husband while he was skiing, and I decided that I would bite off an ice climbing class up on the wow. Meredith Lodge. And I did it with a bunch of 30-year-old guys, and I wanted it so bad. My goal 
this year is to go climbing, ice climbing, hopefully the Fang in Ouray, Colorado. More podcast episodes to come. And this is perfect because this story just keeps getting better and you just keep leveling up and Hollywood's going to pick up on this. And at some point, they're going to want to make a movie about your story. Oh my and God. I want to know when they do, who's going to be the Hollywood actress that's going to play you in your movie? Whoa. Okay. All right. I will say this. One thing that I absolutely love, and this is something that hit me this year, is um, Jodie Foster. Ooh. I love Jodie Foster yeah. for so many reasons, but Jodie Foster has aged gracefully and I love how she's aged gracefully. So I have to say, I would think that it would be so badass if yeah, Jodie Foster played Jody me. Foster. Might be a little older than me, but I love, she's just been in some recent shows, yeah. you know, this year. And I'm like, yes, she's aging gracefully and not conforming to the rest of what society tells us we should look like when we're in our 50s. What's maybe your movie going to be? What's my movie going to be? What's it going to be called? Oh, maybe The Fang. Ooh, <laughs> the Fang. You got to look up The Fang. It's oh, actually yeah. really terrifying. All right, I, show, I did show it to my husband the other day and he's like, yikes. Yeah. I said, maybe you better up my life insurance a little bit. There you go. The Fang starring Jodie Foster. I love this so much. Tammy, I, this has been so much fun. If people want to connect with you or find out more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? The best way is Instagram. I'm Tammy on the trail on Instagram. I do have a website. I'm still working on it. I'm adding things to it. And I really want to start sharing my trails that I do as well as some of the traveling that I do. I love to adventure travel. I never go. I always have those moments where I'm like, hey, wouldn't it be so nice to just go sit on the beach? And I go there and I'm like, okay, where are we going? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go zip lining or let's go trekking. And it's never a sit down and enjoy the beach. Moment. Let's go do some hard <laughs> things. I just want to thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been a super fun conversation. And for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. Hope Tammy's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or just need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire on your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Tammy, thank you awesome. so much for being thank here. Thank you. Awesome. I really appreciate the opportunity.